kello on 13.00. Um, hello and welcome. This was the only bit I'm going to talk in Finnish. Uh, my name is Jussi Parikka. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Southampton, as well as at, at the Academy of Performing Arts in Prague, um, where I lead the project on operational images. But today, I'm here to uh, be in conversation and to introduce first um, Samir Bomik, um, um, an artist and a scholar, um, Helsinki-based artist and scholar, whose work, um, Lost Islands, is part of the Helsinki Biennial. So uh, first, before I continue, um, wel welcome to Samir as well. It's really nice to be in conversation with you again. Hi, really glad to be here again, you see, and continue our conversation from previously. Exactly. So um, I also want to, I mean, my first words were supposed to be that happy Tuve Janssen Day to everyone as well. That's quite fitting in many ways that will become clear when we um, enter into the conversation mode. But I won't do a long introduction of you, Samir, but basically just, just to our viewers and our listeners, um, Samir Bomik, as mentioned, is a Helsinki-based uh, artist and a researcher um, um, who's worked at Alta University and will start at University of Arts and uh, whose work has engaged both in um, different installation works and performance works with questions of energy and ecology, of minerals and the materiality of digital culture, um, starting from early work that was on um, deep times of cultural memory and cultural institutions to more recent um, both writing and indeed artistic work that has continued these ecological themes, which is why it's natural to have Samir's work um, um, as part of Helsinki uh, Biennial as well. Um, uh, the IIPC report released this morning um, that voiced um, again that major climate changes are inevitable and irreversible um, is something that will like pretty much you know I'm guaranteed to say will set the tone and the context for our discussion today as well as a broader context in which this artistic work and the topics from theoretical humanities and and, and questions of research in general are, are placed as well. And I'm sure that we'll return to that at least indirectly as well. Um, our plan um, is to engage in a conversation with Samir about his work, uh, the work together with Ezefe Sutinen and the performance team, um, collaborative piece of work um, on, on this piece, Lost Islands, which is on at the moment in Vallisari as part of Helsinki, uh, biennial. Um, and we decided with Samir that even if this is a conversation for the next hour or the next 57 minutes, we decided that um, I should first kick things off with a short introduction type of a talk, a sort of an additional approach to the themes of lost islands, hence um, themes such as islands and the Anthropocene in the context of this artwork. What's certain is that the work itself already presents a strong narrative of its artistic, um, social, theoretical contexts um, of the piece as a continuation of theoretical work on race and Anthropocene, on politics of geology, and on questions such as why particular kinds of spatial and infrastructural tropes they present a ground on which we make sense of also let's say social life as well why do we speak of geology when we say we want to talk about politics is the key theme that runs through a lot of um, lost islands and, and our conversation why have these tropes of geography even geology become ways to engage with also digital media culture but also temporal historical questions that are present in our engagement with climate and the environment. So, I mean, we could continue as a you know, research talk, the two of us with Samir, on the topic of islands and the Anthropocene. It has also recently popped up quite directly in research. Um, there's a really very recent book by Jonathan Pugh 
on Anthropocene islands, but also in broader terms in critical human geography, um, critical post-humanities, and many other fields that you'll see entering and slipping into our conversation with Samir. Um, my talk is a variation on the main theme, already very visible and present in Lost Islands as a spatial, situated and moving narrative. Some might even refer to this piece as cinematic, but st strictly speaking, moving images feature only briefly inside the piece in the form of an animation that you can visit in Vallisari, and, and which you can see um, on the online trailer that was released about the work. And we were hoping that we could share at the beginning of this um, the trailer as well to anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but we were not able to do that now. So please, um, after our short talk and our conversation, go online and find um, Samir's page on the Helsinki Biennial and you'll find the trailer as well. It gives you a kind of a glimpse of the work in case you haven't already seen it. Um, as mentioned, I'll be picking up on points that are very much present of, in the piece already. I'm not going to do an artistic, I mean, theoretical explanation of Samir when, when he's sitting there. We're going to have a conversation. But some of these themes do resonate with my own work in books such as Geology of Media and A Slow Contemporary Violence, another book, a short book, um, which also present a point of reflection for our conversation. Uh, they're not the main feature today, though. Just to say, though, to highlight the link, both books outlined that contemporary media technologies and infrastructures of digitality have a fundamental relation to geology and the earth and its political histories. Um, as mentioned already, and Samir mentioned this, we've been in longer dialogue with Samir about many ideas on infrastructure and visual culture, art methods and Anthropocene, which is why this discussion today presents a continuation of earlier themes. And if you want to tap into some of our earlier conversations that have been published, there's a quite a recent one um, that we did for Ichme um, Helsinki, Ichme Helsinki organization, um, that you'll find online as well as a podcast. And of course, we obviously hope that you already um, have experienced Lost Islands, um, the performance and the live performance, uh, and if not, will spark uh, the desire for you to go and see it soon. Um, so I'll continue for a short while with my um, introductory talk. Um, Lost Islands really starts as a declaration and a cry of exhaustion. The tour guide sets the scene and Ireland does the rest. The narrative device of infrastructural cable has its own role to play. But the words pronounced by Samir at the beginning, the tour guide, open up a world as well as an affect. No more, we're tired, we're really tired of white geology and its political history. This geology is not merely that of scientific methods, but their relation to colonial institutions. The world that has measured and surveyed and made into property through violent operations. Geology is not approached only as any kind of a universal science of the earth and its history, but also as a very practical venture for several hundreds of years now that has fueled the birth of modern society, including birth of modern digital culture from Netflix to advanced military technologies. This refers to the crucial backbone of minerals and other mineral mined materials of extraction and extraction industries and processing of earth matter as commodity, and the rolling out of that matter as part of infrastructure of the modern world. So at the back of many theorists, such as Catherine Yusuf, um, Lost Island spills a historical narrative and a spatial topography, an island at the end of the Anthropocene, this contested term for periodization of human influence that have, many have noted is one inherently tied to histories of capitalism, histories of colonialism, even histories of white supremacy. Lost Islands is in this way a narrative of racial capitalism, and as such a particularly urgent one, considering the ongoing discussions of climate change and social justice. Hence, I haven't, you know, released only a couple of hours ago, the most recent report, so it's probably something to read for all of us today, at least the executive summary. So the question of how to transform societies from petrol 
imaginaries and fossil fuel infrastructures to sustainable futures, but also they need to be unsustainable to the idea of business as usual. The other kinds of sustainable futures have to be planetary in the fundamental sense, not merely of here and now on our home turf, whether that is Helsinki or an island somewhere, on an island that we would defend against a hostile outside based on a narrative of a nation state or a violent sovereignty of us against them. That's, that's a completely bankrupt idea by now. But of large scale interdependencies that have to be weighed in ways, ways, weighed in ways that build a narrative of justice. The accumulated responsibility of pollution across decades, across centuries, in the context of the current situation, as one of rising sea waters, of vulnerability, of uneven distribution of the effects of this change. So, if Lost Islands is a story of racial capitalism, it is also one of environmentalism of the poor. As Rob Nixon puts it, the perspective forces us to consider the slowness, even invisibility of climate change, or for example, biodiversity crisis, in respect to the unseen poor of the planet. Not planet as a generic, we are all in this together, but as one historical accumulation of waste, especially in particular bodies and in particular locations. We're constantly having to figure out the world by proxies, these signs of change that is not visible in one observation, in one picture, but is visible across time series, which puts a different emphasis on the very useful term by Susan Tripley, uh, what Susan Tripley has called material witnessing. These proxies that we use to observe the impact of change, climate change, environmental um, um, uh, issues, environmental damage, they can be also human bodies, which are involved, not separated from nature and environmental processes. Um, here, I think it's useful to mention the term by Sean Cubitt. Sean Cubitt has referred to this as integral waste this aspect of capitalism that preys upon vulnerable bodies that become the site of accumulation of risks and toxins. So the theme of the black body is particularly central in Samir's work, a point we will return to in our discussion for sure. The bodies in the performance piece are laboring bodies of work, but they're also observing and noting, they're acting as witnesses of sorts, who also invite the participants, the, the group, to see and to follow a routine of their gestures that seems to survive after some sort of an unnamed crash of which the remnants of the island are a trace. The island itself is a trace. So what happened? This is a fundamental question, whatever answer we might get. What happened? It's the format of asking that actually counts. What happened is a question one asks when faced with ruins and proxies of an earlier society. What happened is one something you ask when entering a scene of devastation or other, trying to connect the dots and the pieces of the puzzle of what happened. Was it one event of proportions familiar to genres that revolve around a spectacular catastrophe, one single thing, or a slow process of change that swallowed coastlines and they swallowed islands, they brought storms and they brought drought, they brought forest fires, and they brought flooding in unequal measures. What happened or nothing at once? This question is central to the problem of novels about climate change, about writing and narrativizing climate change, as Amitabh Ghosh argues in um, his The Great Derangement, a collection of essays of how to write in the context of the Anthropocene, as it features somewhat in the scenes of Lost Island, which is not a piece of writing so much as a piece of performance, but it's still a narrative that takes place and space across 
the island. A similar toll to what Lamida of course mentions really runs through lost islands, as it is about a memory of the past that is enacted through these performing bodies. The performers are immersed in technology. We are guided to observe the relations of nature and infrastructure. So the abandoned buildings of Vallisari are a quirky, certain kind of a cinematic background for these scenes, which at times feature props of communication technologies, but are clearly presented in a state of obsolescence. So the archaeological dig of Vomix and Samir's tour is one that features not the museum of past technology, but the present of ruins and debris. So communication and media is suggested in this key as debris and ruins of past infrastructure, a reminder of this toxic legacy as witnessed by the piling up of electronic waste that has become one crucial part of narratives in media studies as well. That we don't just focus on networking, but we focus also on the totality of things not working and haunted by a sense of obsolete obsolescence. This has also forced media studies, among many other humanities topics and other fields, to face the task of redefining what works, what does not work, beyond the, you know, the, the gadget culture of consumer electronics, and to focus on other levels of production, and especially also maintenance, as repair, a significant element in a different scale of mediation and how we understand the technological world around us, not as separated from nature in any, any way. As far as mediation goes, um, it is not merely one of broken down devices or signal uh, that they signal something, you know, signals of a radio station that is picking up um, 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 some, some last traces of, 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 of transmission, but it's a whole ensemble of action. Nature and its elements from fire to water and more and the infrastructures that are already provided are also part of how we understand mediation. This is a point made by John Durham Peters in his work, including the book Marvelous Clouds, um, on the elemental, um, um, sort of elemental philosophy of media, uh, but also what made by me in geology of media as well. Um, but let's not get carried away and go into academic disciplines of media studies. That's not the topic today. We want to return to the island as it's being opened up through narrative paths. It's been opened up the central stage of conflict and history. The island itself is a really interesting uh, political trope, but also a physical formation and actual geographical geological island. But it, of course, it is a rhetorical trope that we found, have found in arts and literature for ages. But instead of the perhaps worn out Robinson Crusoe's, the stakes are not to reproduce any earlier civilization like Robinson Crusoe wanted. Instead of Crusoe's attempts to reestablish what was once a property, um, you know, what was once a property relation and racial relations that he was familiar with, the stakes are in inventing something new to go by, a different kind of society. The islands is a frontier of such sorts, with the, which still mostly relates in our world to real estate values or tourism, or to military security importance of islands as well, as well as their proximity to particular extraction sites. Um, you know, seabed extraction sites, for instance. But something else is also brought to the fore across the narratives of lost islands. I'm curious about the question of if they're lost islands, they're lost to who? They're not lost to the inhabitants, not the sort of a world building that already takes place in lost islands, the performance. So these are some of the questions that came to my mind when I visited the tour and I was trying to think of how to express this as a sort of a warm up to our conversation. See, these are the couple of questions and suggestions in my opening words. And now is the time for us to continue in a proper dialogue with Samir, um, instead of me um, continuing along my theoretical path that we can sort of uh, expand on, um, but I think it's much better 
do that in proper um, 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 dialogical format to get uh, more voices to the scene. Um, Samir, thanks again for doing this. I'm really, I'm really happy to be doing this with you, and I was really happy to be um, in dialogue with you um, in the project. So I think it's my, I need to thank you to having involved um, you know, me, me, me in, your, in this work. Um, I'm so glad you are with us. Yeah, I want to ask you, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll use some questions as prompts, even if we'll probably end up in a conversational mode and you know, we can exchange back and forth some ideas and, and you can sort of, I mean, I've had the privilege of hearing things uh, when you were developing them as well. But I want to um, us to restage also some of those conversations. Um, let's start with Ireland. To start with the island as a troll, but also as a physical location. I just mentioned in passing in my brief opening notes, but I would like to ask you to as well, and especially you, to talk about more about your decision to uh, build the performance around this theme. Obviously, this relates closely to the very, you know, the more broader biennial themes as such, the sea, etc. And the physical location, but can you just sort of a like um, um, start building also as a sense of, of how did you want to approach um, the island, both in a history to say as a theoretical topic, because it's not only theoretical, but I think what you know, what you mean somewhere between a material context and and something that really sparks our imagination, but also um, our vocabularies. First of all, thank you. You see, that was a wonderful bag to to what we've been doing here in Lost Islands. Um, this is, um, I mean, there were several things happening at the time when curators uh, Pir Kosi, Tari, and Taru Tapula called me, and uh, so I went over to him to discuss this. And uh, I was still in my, uh, what do you call the howlery, the work outfit. I was uh, welding some screws and doing a work on another installation. So I rushed to him uh, in my outfit, uh, which was pretty not very appropriate for the occasion. Um, and we discussed about this and the same sea was what Pir Kuantaru talked about. And this is the theme of the biennial the sea that connects everybody, the sea on which anything happens has an impact on different societies and different nations and cultures. And uh, it made sense to me at that time, because I was also teaching about infrastructure, teaching about uh, how communications happens through the you know undersea submarine cables, the global network mm -hmm. of cables. Um, that, and also in the research I was doing and looking at um, uh, not just the materiality of communication, but also had started looking at extraction, uh, extractive processes, and uh, so. So all this sort of came together. And on a personal note, it was an autobiographical book that I've been writing um, that also has mm -hmm. something to do with this project. Um, in the book, I explore, which is written now, and I'm just typing it up at the moment. Um, yeah. I, explore, I explore the sort of geographies and geologies of the city its environments, its landscape and environment, but in relation as an immigrant body, as a, as a, as a black and brown body. Um, so I explore the terrain uh, as part of me, as, as me, as the, as the city and the island as the body. So this is also something which came into uh, uh, my thoughts at the moment. Um, so, and also we were, uh, if you remember Memory Machines, which was also a project we did earlier, uh, mm. used the method of a performance to look, look mm. into these uh, these issues. Um, so all mm. of that came together, and 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 I my proposal was a performative expedition that would run through the island, so we would kind of scale it up, and and 
discuss these topics and but also through performance through sort of a a larger context of the terrain and the history and the infrastructure of the island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me follow up on a couple of things you mentioned there as well. I mean, there would be several as well. Um, I'm curious to you know talk more about. I mean, I, I like I really love the reference um, to to. It's like there's these different strands in your work that are sort of a or sometimes nicely mixing up and and influencing each other. Like in this case, um, um, um the autobiographical book that you um once showed me as well. And that you said that you're now uh, typing up as well, um, which is super interesting, especially in this context. And then the question of the island as a very concrete, concrete site where you have to start landing and unfolding. But also before going into that as well, um, I know that in the earlier part as well, um, when you when you actually pitched um, and, and and things started rolling with uh, curators, the biennial curators as well, and we also had dialogues. Um, um, literature featured already in that stage as a way of sort of a trying to um, um, think through of what is what is an island, what is an island as as an affect and as a particular form of narrative. Um, that's why I wanted to plant there, and it, I mean it's perfect that we're doing this on Tuve Jansson Day, right? Um, mm -hmm. Tuve Jansson's short story about the island is one uh, influence, if one can say it in those terms, right? Absolutely. I think Tuve Janssen's, uh, uh, Tuve Janssen's uh, uh, writing on the island is absolutely uh, a fantastic writing. I mean, everyone should read it up. And it actually forms one of my references during the performative walk. And, and there are quotations which I directly take from Tuve Janssen and Catherine Yusuf and, and yourself. Um, so mm. I, I think the island, um, it's interesting, like the, the mm. lost islands and by islands also, it's such an amazing word that it can be metaphorically connected to so many different things and issues. Yeah. And I look, at, I look at the island as a body. To me, the island mm -hmm. is a body. It's me, it's my skin, it's my bones, it's my head. It's, it mm. becomes part of me. And, and that's how I would want to feel it and want to experience it. So, so when I also talk about lost islands, I'm talking about these bodies and you know, these entities, which are, we are lost. And, and in the aftermath of um, our technological uh, sort of breakdown. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wanted to look at the island, something, in isolation, but also something we are all islands, as they say, you know, but are not really. Uh, but somehow mm -hmm. to 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 take that word and then expand it also in a terms of technology, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the uh, human psyche, in terms of race relation, in terms of politics. So so it really mm -hmm. is a very versatile uh, mm -hmm. term there, and so lost islands becomes to explore those lost uh, um, mm. of sort of uh, sensorial, the lost uh, feelings, the lost understandings, which we have, and mm. we have come to this now today. Yeah, that's a really great way of um, explaining as well, even if, if we know, we don't want to kind of a, like explain the artwork in terms of theory because it's 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 a it's a body in itself that is constituted in the form that I think it helps to also maneuver the weight in with the richness of of the topic and I I like the sort of a like um 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 analogy or the sort of a entanglement of the island as a geographical body with with the body that is also a moving body uh, a migratory body. And I can see that there's lots of ways in which it sort of a hints in really nice ways of these sort of a like questions of what is a border, how do we move across borders, the whole big bundle of themes that post-colonial um, research and more recently also decolonial research has picked up on as well and becomes this sort of a like interesting idea that exactly that, you know, the body, whether it's, it's the, you know, at the same time, the geographical body of the island, but also your body is, is a site of inscription. 
So the fact that it seemed to be at first like a, perhaps to use those, you know, like those, you know, Gilles Deleuze, the philosopher, has this wonderful essay on desert islands, but that, you know, also noting that no island is ever deserted, even, you know, it, I mean, there's an there's interesting contrast there as well. And in a similar way that the body is always inscribed by all kinds of forces, technological, um, racialized forces, um, um, historical themes and such. So I think I, I really like the richness that comes out there that you um, draw out uh, with the mix. Mm. Speaking of material forces, um, the, the other side of the island is really is, is about very concretely about how did you start unfolding um, the idea of, of doing a performance on in, in Vallisari as well. The idea that, you know, this includes, would you like to talk a bit more about uh, the question of how do, did you start dealing with the scale of the island um, and how it became a concrete part of how you start building and going back and forth negotiating with the material context and the space of the island and your co-performers um your group the choreographer and everybody there to also the credit i mean i'm, I'm just you know they've, they've done wonderful work so how did you start how did this process can you talk a bit more about the process of understanding of what is the entry point to start doing a performance that has to do with concrete terrains as well Absolutely. Um, this has been a project for uh, making in two years. Um, we would have, uh, we started in 2019. Um, mm. So it's been, uh, it was a good time. Of course, we got postponed last summer, but I think mm. it really helped us to further refine and further refocus on certain things. Um, yeah, so there's been basically that preparatory part there and then there is the sort of majorly the rehearsals with the performers with the team and the costumes and the sound design so there are there are two the first one was a bit longer span and the second is a shorter span but more high density work um it it mm -hmm. took uh I have to say the the scale of the island is is you you really like uh, the last project which was at the Helsinki Central Library OD. We are talking about four levels, you know, walking back and forth through different spaces, indoor spaces. Um, mm, yeah. But here we are we are talking in kilometers. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, we are um, we are talking about uh, rough terrain. There's a lot of uh, uh top levels like heights and lows um mm -hmm. it's uh it's a rocky bushy wilderness um so first thing was that i was very interested how to bring the idea of the sea of the same sea also mm -hmm. as part of uh to connect that like say two sides mm -hmm. of the same island and um mm -hmm the cable which i was looking at uh, which is a basically you know data cable and it connects the world yeah. that became a sort of a method to to start examining a route through the island so so mm -hmm. it took time to build a route through islands uh, through, through the wilderness through the bunker through uh, buildings through different mm -hmm. scales so so also the kind of also had to bring in the different uh, thematics into the root um, and then so that was the first part we took a lot of work mm -hmm. into uh, uh, setting up a perfect route for a performance and, and I think the second part where we conducted the rehearsals with the team in which um, mm -hmm. we actually uh, the performances designed itself together now it's me as Sutin and Yani Toivola, Amira Khalifa and Jeffrey Arista. So these are, mm. we are the main performers. And uh, mm. a lot of what happens along this route is done by practice, by, um, by, uh, by trial and error, a lot of things. Mm. There's a lot of logistical questions and uh, timing mm. and synchronization. So, so it really mm. is, a, you know, when you do a site specific project, it, uh, it takes an amazing amount of, uh, of rehearsing, time, uh, planning, coordination, 
And I think the mm-hmm. uh, the Helsinki Biennial, the the Biennial uh, folks have been exceedingly helpful with that, and, and uh, so we were able to organize this, and uh, we were able to uh, do our rehearsals and uh, and make this come true as a performative expedition. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, so there's been a quite much work on this uh, and it's only one and a half hours one hour 20 minutes um, yeah. uh, we also want to drop the methods we don't want to you know once you do all this and you realize oh it's only one hour 15 minutes and we did a lot of work yeah. but you know the, there's been a lot of methods to it a lot of work on it yeah exactly um and then it also involves like well i mean as as you know, and as people listening know, I'm not I'm not a performance art specialist, even if I'm um, always interested in this sort of a um, and broader context of performance as a way of involving um, 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 gestures and bodies and and temporality of bodies with the spatial um, terrain in ways that becomes really entangled. That that's very much present in the ways in which one moves with your group of you know after the the performers and yourself um, on, in, in Vallisari as well. So there's a lot there. And one thing that comes to my mind in this way is also that, you know, besides all the ways in which you started to think about the scale of a performance that is multiple kilometers and still has to have a certain kind of a dramatic way of, you know, drawing people in and, and, and being able to punctuate it accordingly, it's also a life. I mean, it's it's very much to say to say the obvious. It's a, every time it's a live performance, which means that um, the participants, the ones that sign up, that us who sign up for that, are you know obviously part of it as well. So there's something about this this uh, mutating form in this sense that is, um, I guess, changes the performance um, every time you do it, right? Absolutely, no single performance is the same. Um, Mm -hmm. it's always different. Every day is different. Um, the weather's different. Um, people act different, (laughs) the audiences. So, uh, it's, it's like a moving, like you're just standing on this moving piece of raft on a open sea. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, if that metaphor would work, but, um, it's not so uh, lost, but, um, we are, we pretty know what we're doing there. But definitely, uh, every day is different. Uh, the audience mm-hmm. is a key and a crucial part of this project. Um, I've always been interested in participation, um, mm-hmm. like since my doctoral studies, we always did participatory mm-hmm. projects. And uh, so even in performance, I see participation as really as a part of immersion as a part of uh, uh, prov- provocation, as a part of destabilization. Um, I think also it's crossed my mind and it, and it comes from our previous discussion also is, is how to bring these topics, these really uh, hard theoretical topics or these bigger questions of climate change and global warming and you know big chunk mm-hmm. words and how to bring them and like performatively uh, in a site. And um, so mm-hmm. it's with performance, I realized there's a sort of a multi-sensory uh, aspect to it. Mm-hmm. And there is a direct access to the audience, which you do not have with a paper mm-hmm. or a, a, a say a, something virtual. So here I am standing face to face with say 20 plus people. Yeah. Um, and there is a dynamism to that. There's a body movement to that. There's the terrain, when you move through the terrain, the places, the sound, the senses, they're mm-hmm. all, you know, you know, you're all, you get into this sort of immersive act. Um, so in the performances, mm-hmm. we've tried to uh, uh, accommodate as much participation and in moments like we ask the, partic- uh, the audience to join in so when we are walking through these expeditions the the audience become part of the expeditionary force if you may call it Mm -hmm. Uh, it sounds very Mm -hmm. colonial there but like an expeditionary (laughs) uh, group and a team um so we 
so the idea of the project is also to the audience there is no backstage there is no front stage and mm-hmm. we're all in it together so we're yeah. all in it together mm-hmm. we are going to experience this together let's experience mm-hmm. it as a group let's you know share the moments let's uh, carry forward mm-hmm. i mean that's mm-hmm. how i uh, we envisioned uh, participation mm-hmm. by the audience mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's something about, again, I, I keep on asking this every time when we have conversations, whether it's more public like this or not every time when we do informal conversations. But one thing that is this, that again, it, it, it's, a, it's a setup. There's perhaps two questions here as well. I used a bit haphazardly, a bit sort of a loosely the term cinematic earlier and we um, you know one question would be that how do you relate this to the idea is it cinematic or is that completely wrong and a bit sort of a like um, um naive way of putting it and what is the relation the other one is about something and this is the what i keep on asking you quite often is that um you as trained also as an architect as well there's a sense of space and how you can understand space and this is not again a architect necessary an architect to use the space that is really tightly about measurement and, and 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 form in that sense but there is a it, the talk could be said to be a cartography of different thresholds of space indoors outdoors across um, inside an island containment but also any kind of a containment is never contained it's always full of all kinds of signals that enter it, the space so there's two things here that sort of I somehow want to tease out a bit as well. That is there is there reference to the cinematic a bit too um, a too bit too casual. How do you relate to it? And on the other hand, I, if you have further thoughts about what I said about those spatial thresholds, um, perhaps we already in a way covered some of that. But if you want to continue with anything, please do. Um, I think you hit upon a very uh, uh crucial thing here is about the sort of architectural uh, experience or also the sort of spatial experience of things. Perhaps that Mm. helps uh, Mm. coming from that background. And uh, there is a, I I have, I at least feel like when I walk through the space, through this certain route, there's a sort of always a spatial awareness of the, of the surroundings, of the sound, Mm. uh, the, the smells and uh, and I think it played a mm-hmm. important role in deciding how we go from cable landing one to cable landing two, yeah. and uh, I was perhaps not thinking like a cable, but I was thinking more like a sort of a, a performance as a sort of mm-hmm. and also as setting up certain spaces. So there are uh, there are different. Uh, spaces are smaller than they open up in some in some points there are choke points there's darkness there's heat there's humidity so there are these mm. sort of a variation mm. of spaces with which uh, we were working with like mm. if you go to the mine it's hot and humid and if you go to the mm. other the core it's like almost hot media hot media cold and when mm. you go to the other end where there is you know the 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 performer or the character dealing with the afterlife of technology yeah. it's a cold space it's a cold yeah. space so yeah. there is a spatial aspect to it and which is also which is combined with the sensorial aspect about as a cinematic uh, method i w- i would say there is an aspect of also framing the the performance mm like the backgrounds and the foregrounds where you stand and what distance and what so this we went through uh, during rehearsals and to mm. get a clearer idea of like how far is the visual uh, horizon how far is the audience looking at what do we want to capture at the moment but of course as mm. you know like immersive um, with an immersive site specific project is incredibly difficult to sometimes keep the frame there's people walking in there are uh, yeah. tourists um <clears throat> there's a plane flying there there's a uh, birds 
Um, so yeah. we just have to, we adapt, we take the frame, the frame which we have built on, and then we include these other intrusive elements into the frame as a sort of a live continuation of the same act. And, uh, yeah. and I think this is what, uh, what I mean when I said every performance is different. Mm, so mm, there is not mm. single act which is if you come tomorrow you'll have a different experience mm, mm, yeah exactly yeah it's it's um yeah it makes complete sense it's um yeah uh, there's something about the cinematic here exactly in those terms that is somehow we could start unfolding it through the references to how to frame and how to narrativize. But there's also other aspects of, of how to, and this is not, you know, I mean, I'm just realizing that and that's why I'm thinking aloud. The other aspects relate to um, something that um, Juliana Bruno, the um, uh, theorist of space and cinema has really well placed um, and, and articulated in her book, Atlas of Emotion where the whole entanglement of architecture and cinema is a particular relation of past 120 years at least unfolds to a long history of motion. Motion in relation to moving bodies that become framed in relation to cinematic technologies, but they also feature outside it. So a, a history of this sort of a cinema is not just cinema technology, but a history of moving bodies of particular kinds, which is why Bruno also then sort of a, ex expands from ideas of motion to traveling, um, quite literally traveling and traveling technologies and hence themes of migration become at the center of this, this long hundreds of years of cinema. That is the question of migration. And, and we have to, of course, include um, um, you know, refugees and, and multiple other forms of forced traveling, as well as motion to emotion, uh, a thing that Bruno underlines as well. Motion and emotion are very much entangled into a moving body. So the moving body is an emo emoting, affecting body, affective body as well. So that's, there's that link as well that I just realized is quite intriguing, I think, that actually really works well in your work that is not about cinema's projection, but it's cinema of, of obviously movement and moving body. If, if I may add to that, um, what you just said about the cinematic frame, and uh, I am sitting mm. on the uh, cutting table with, uh, with uh, mm. thousands of uh, uh, hours of footage. Uh, we have a film coming out of this performance. But yeah, when I'm sitting at the cutting table, I realized that uh, and the, the film was shot by cinematographer Christopher Thomas uh, and mm -hmm. Roxana Sadvokasova. Um, when I sit now and look at the cut, I realized that what can be cinema and what is performance, the two different animals, they can mm -hmm. never be the same. Um, there's a lot of things which can be cinematically shown uh, uh, performatively different and it's vice versa. What works mm -hmm. as performance, it's very hard to, uh, uh, as a film. So uh, in the cinema, when you capture it in the camera, when we captured the performance on camera, we realized like there are, there are certain emotions, there's a time frame, there's a certain capture of the emotion, a certain capture of the movement of the body. And, and these things become very important while, mm -hmm. while building the sort of cinematic uh, others uh, art project for the same project. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. they both don't go together. And, uh, and I feel like somehow the performance expands the frame. You always get out of the frame. And in mm -hmm. cinema, you have to cut, cut to the frame, keep the frame. You have to fill mm -hmm. in the frame and you're always sort of faking it in some ways just mm -hmm. to make the frames work. And in performance, we, we just, it's just such a freestyle cinema. You can literally call it like that. You always are stepping in, out, in, out of the frame. So it becomes this very sort of a uh, non-linear way of uh, looking almost a non-linear framing of events. And I think that brings a really richness and sort of authenticity to also these different mm -hmm. um, 
sort of sensorial environment around which the audience is going through. Mm. So that, that was just a sense. comment. Or... I think it's a really great comment in terms of because I'm 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 I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm pretty sure everybody who's watching and listening is as well is that there will be the um the the, you know, the video of the cinema piece coming out later as well that will um and, and it's going to be a great way of understanding the different modalities of the piece um we got 10 minutes left and i want to i want to dip into a couple of topics before we need to close our sort of a lunch time or late lunch time um and conversation one is quite an obvious thing again but i think it might intrigue a lot of us and it relates to this whole tone of our conversation and your work as well which is so clearly um, really uh, about particular ways in which you uh, work as a researcher and an educator um, and because you mentioned already early on your work as an educator at Aldo in this case and of course you'll continue a different you know, role as well soon um, but then also as, a, as an artist who's worked with installation with, and now with performance and such can you I mean this is a big topic that has lots of you know historical and contemporary discussions about artistic research and such, but how do you combine and see these different roles and how they come together and how they separate um, from, from different activities? Yeah, this is, um, this is a perennial question and a sort of <laughs> perennial quest, self, self uh, targeted, self addressed question. And, uh, and I think I'm quite, I mean, I used to doubt myself about it, but I think I've gotten pretty comfortable with the multifaceted or the multi uh, uh, sort of brain work you have to do on this. And I, mm -hmm. and I, and I think it's really, uh, I mean, issues are complex. The world is a pretty mm -hmm. complex today. Uh, you know, all the environmental issues, are we talking about cultural issues and sociocultural? So, I mean, I think we are at a point also as an art, artistic work or performing art or mm. exploring art requires a certain sort of a multi-headed uh, approach. And uh, that's just my personal uh, opinion, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, so I, I like it. I like juggling between research, artistic work, uh, writing, performing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it does take time away from the actual sort of getting ac the academic points of a publication. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I feel uh, a publication would be even more interesting if it was, you know, based off a real artistic project in which we could actually discover new methods and new ways of mm -hmm. uh, looking at things and it makes it richer so if i just uh, so i i do prefer the sort of mm -hmm. field led um, mm -hmm. um research sort of a more art led mm -hmm. i would say mm -hmm. i mean at some point i have done research based art um yeah. this is false into that but i also think the artistic methods could also uh, be very crucial in this so yes i'm yeah. pretty it's it's a juggling act of course one i mean we can i guess we can self you know advertise now as well that of course the, the work that you did um at audi um a couple of years back in 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 that collaboration and 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 that is coming out also in leonardo journal as well the thing that we co-wrote as well as a way of trying to articulate without trying to be explaining oh how to see art, but also drawing out some of the methods of, of what is an interesting aspect of, for instance, of an infrastructural tour as a method of investigating, like you put it, investigating infrastructure. And in this case, in investigating relations of nature, technology, geography, uh, but also uh, racial capitalism, for instance. Um, before we have to close, I want to also like point to this stream of thought as well. So Lost Islands is a project in its own right. It was made for um, Palisar, it was made for the biennial. Um, but I do know also that, um, that you aim to link this into a series of things you're developing, a future versions. Could you just briefly elaborate a bit on the future plans where this project links up what might be coming with your artistic or research or the 
two hats on at the same time and 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 so that we get a glimpse of also where where all of this might be going um yeah so uh, i will be uh, continuing with this um of course uh, lost islands uh, opened up uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, methods and issues and, and topics and uh, mm -hmm. I met a lot of wonderful people uh, met these wonderful team of performers uh, uh, designers and sound designers and so there's a sort of a multidisciplinary uh, mm -hmm. act in it already um, so I mean the topic of uh, extraction interests me the topic yeah. of um, the topic of also uh, ecology and extraction. So I'm going to mm -hmm. continue with this further. Um, I'm very interested in the kind of performing art in the extraction zone and what that means mm -hmm. and uh, and the idea of say the black ecologies and mm -hmm. and so I, I I plan to investigate further. Of course, I go and sit back to my desk and look at where we go from here. But definitely, I'm interested in this uh, sort of a threefold enclosure that Sean Cubit also talks about. Is mm -hmm. is is that how um, these significant stages in human history uh, that you know characterizes extraction and and how and so I want to look mm -hmm. into those topics through also say performance performative methods through installation uh, and film so i would be looking at say starting from the early sort of uh, uh, colonial uh, uh, extraction the times of the metallurgical techniques um, yeah. look at how uh, sort of mechanization took over the hand the body and then how mm -hmm. mechanization itself is now swallowed into artificial intelligence. So there is mm -hmm. this sort of, a, I'm very interested in this sort of evolution of how, what, when, how the pickaxe digging the mm -hmm. earth and is now transformed in this sort of automated automation, complete mm -hmm. autom automated depletion of the earth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, but I do, do I'm do interested in, in in taking this topic to the to as I say to a general audience and I, and I think it would be through art artistic methods performance so I would like to take this topic further uh, perhaps even develop uh, uh, certain performative projects around this topic so that's the plan for mm. the future now. Mm. It's great that you. Uh towards the end I'll mention also an automation because there's there's a stream that I know will link also to contemporary artificial intelligence discussions as well and especially the strand which relates exactly to these questions of um, mining um, and labor um, and the sort of a mobilization of particular kinds of labor regimes and and they're distributed across the planet so there's a lot there that sort of a condenses in your work as well and I think it's kind of a one 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 perhaps, I, I, I'm sure that you approve as well. There's a there's a wonderful uh, essay um, um, so from some years back that we more should return to um, regularly. is is titled "Decolonization is not a metaphor," and and in a similar way, uh, I would say based on your work as well and things that you just described that mining is not a metaphor. It's it's a very concrete um, site of of technological culture, which is become staged uh, again in your work. Um, I'm extremely grateful for this discussion. I've um, I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed a lot. Um, um, I want to thank you, Samir, especially for this conversation and the work. But I want to, as you already mentioned, I want to also just you know signal out. And the list is long, and everybody should go and on the website be and i see the long, all all credits. But at least to you know your performance and choreographer, see Mrs. Sutinen. Yani Toivola, Amira Khalifa, and Jeffrey Arista uh, for the wonderful work um, that I just was really, um, really, really enjoying when I saw the final project as well. So um, thank you, um, Samir. Thank you, Yossi. This is where we have to sign off and we'll be closing our discussion. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And now go see if you have not already go see lost islands performance on at valisari 
thanks. That's uh, me uh, signing off uh, with some uh, goodbye.